doesn't like petty texts, celebrity gossip, dating advice, spicy song lyrics, or just controversial opinions in general. Now imagine all that, but it's historical. In this podcast, we'll be reading some juicy historical letters, diaries, articles, and other piping hot tea. So get yourself something to drink and let's jump into textury. Welcome to another episode of Textry. It is Valentine's Day, so of course we're going to be very cheesy today and we're going to read love letters from the past. Just kidding, we are actually reading breakup letters. <laughs> we're reading letters of heartbreak, letters of disappointment and letters of reproach because that's where the tea is at. So for today, I prepared letters by famous writers from different eras. Um, some, some are vengeful, some are sad, some are wild, but they all deal with the subject of the end of a relationship or with uh, better or worse attempts at seeking closure. So this is going to be a little different than what I intend to do in regular episodes, because instead of beginning with an introduction to the topic or giving you some historical background, we're just going to have a separate introduction before each letter or each author. So um, that's what I'm going to do. And I am basing this episode on one chapter from a really good book by Kathy Davidson called the Book of Love, Writers and Their Love Letters from 1992. And I also found some additional letters that she didn't mention. So before we dive into it, just to give you a little trigger warning that there will be brief mention of suicide attempts throughout this episode. We're gonna start off with Mary Wollstonecraft, a British writer and a feminist that was active in late 18th century. So following a love affair that ended badly, Mary moved to France uh, during the revolution, even though it was a complete mess and all, all her friends were like, Mary, maybe that's not the best idea. <laughs> but she moved anyway. She moved a month before Louis the Sixteenth was executed. And even though her political views aligned with the Girondins, um, which was one of the political fractions at the time, um, it was still the revolution and the political current changed every second um, as she was about to find out the hard way. <laughs> so she moves to Paris and she meets this guy, uh, this American guy, Gilbert Imlay, who is totally a guy that women back then were probably warned about. He was like a typical bad boy with a shady past and he told her from the start that he's not gonna marry her. Now, Mary moves in with him anyway because she's so in love and uh, that she becomes pregnant and he's like, wow, this family life is so confining, this is so hard and I have so many things to achieve and I need space. <laughs> and he leaves them. He says he's coming back, but he essentially leaves Mary and their newborn baby. And to make matters worse, all this happens while the Girondins, who Mary was sympathizing with, get politically wrecked by the Jacobins. And there's this whole witch hunt going on. Some of Mary's friends get arrested, some lose their heads, and Mary, who initially believed in the revolution, is like, you know what? I think I'm out of here, like, I've seen enough, I, I still believe in my heart that at some point this is all going to work out, but right now this is way more than I signed up for. And unfortunately for her, there are some legal issues with foreigners leaving France during all this turmoil, and uh, then it is completely outlawed, and she is stuck in France, away from her family and friends, uh, with a tiny baby, and an avoidant boyfriend who's never there, so... Uh, and now this is the only good thing that Gilbert Imlay has probably done in his life. So they went to an American embassy and they wrote Mary down as his wife, even though they were not actually married. But this way she gained American citizenship and was not as much at risk. But that was pretty much the only good thing he did. After countless letters, after returning to England and uh, two suicide attempts later, Mary finally comes to her senses and decides to break it off. So here are two of her last letters to him in very different tones, even though they were both written in December 1795. 
the first one is sort of giving all the receipts and the second one is much colder and, and like very final. And I'm assuming that his reply to the first one was just this breaking point that confirmed to her that he truly doesn't care. So here's the first of the breakup letters that she sent. As the parting from you forever is the most serious event of my life, I will once expostulate with you and call not the language of truth and feeling ingenuity. I know the soundness of your understanding and know that it is impossible for you always to confound the caprices of every wayward inclination with the manly dictates of principle. You tell me that I torment you. Why do I? Because you cannot estrange your heart entirely from me, and you feel that justice is on my side. Slay Mary. You urge that your conduct was unequivocal. It was not. When your coolness has hurt me, with what tenderness have you endeavored to remove the impression? And even before I returned to England, you took great pains to convince me that all my uneasiness was occasioned by the effect of a worn-out constitution. And you concluded your letter with these words, Business alone has kept me from you. Come to any port and I will fly down to my two dear girls with a heart all their own. So he was practically gaslighting her. He was like, you're just very tired and you're being dramatic and it's just my work that's keeping me away from you. If you come to any port, like I will meet you any moment because I miss you, la la la. <laughs> so then she, she goes on saying, with these assurances, is it extraordinary that I should believe what I wished? I might and did think that you had a struggle with old propensities, but I still thought that I and virtue should at last prevail. I still thought that you had a magnanimity of character which would enable you to conquer yourself. Imlay, the first time she addresses him by his name, his last name though. Believe me, it is not romance. You have acknowledged to me feelings of this kind. You could restore me to life and hope and the satisfaction you would feel would amply repay you. In tearing myself from you, it is my own heart I pierce and the time will come when you will lament that you have thrown away a heart that even in the moment of passion you cannot despise. I would owe everything to your generosity. But for God's sake, keep me no longer in suspense. So clearly she still has feelings for him, but all she's seeking is basically closure, like for him to tell her that it's over and she should move on. So I don't know what he replied, but the, the next letter she sent sounded like this. You must do as you please with respect to the child. I could wish that it might be done soon, that my name may be no more mentioned to you. It is now finished. Convinced that you have neither regard nor friendship, I disdain to utter a reproach, though I have had reason to think that the forbearance talked of has not been very delicate. It is, however, of no consequence. I am glad you are satisfied with your own conduct. So I'm assuming in, in his reply he was like, I haven't done anything wrong. <laughs> I now solemnly assure you that this is an eternal farewell. Yet I flinch not from the duties which tie me to life. That there is sophistry on one side or other is certain, but now it matters not on which. On my part, it has not been a question of words. Yet your understanding or mine must be strangely warped, for what you term delicacy appears to me to be exactly the contrary. I have no criterion for morality and have thought in vain if the sensations which lead you to follow an ankle or a step be the sacred foundation of principle and affection. Mine has been of a very different nature or it would not have stood the brunt of your sarcasms. The sentiment in me is still sacred. If there be any part of me that will survive the sense of my misfortunes, it is the purity of my affection. The impetuosity of your senses may have led you to term mere animal desire, the source of principle, and it may give zest to some years to come. Whether you will always think so, I shall never know. 
It is strange that in spite of all you do, something like conviction forces me to believe that you are not what you appear to be. I part with you in peace. Wow, this is this is powerful. <laughs> this is a very powerful letter, especially compared to the last one. You can tell she's grown, she's been through it, she is so done. Uh, and also jokes on him because literally nobody remembers Gilbert Imlay and plenty of people are still moved and, and affected by Mary Wollstonecraft's work. Not to mention that she also later gave birth to Mary Shelley. And this is a neat segue actually <laughs> to another letter because Mary Shelley... Mary Shelley was not a girl's girl. So let's start with Harriet Westbrook and Percy Shelley, whose middle name is conveniently pronounced as Bish. <laughs> and I mean... So Harriet was the daughter of a London coffeehouse owner and she went to a fancy girls' school as a child. So in this school, she became friends with Helen Shelley, who was Percy Shelley's younger sister. And when Harriet is 15, she starts a little thing with Percy, who was 18 at the time. And everyone's like, oh, that's so cute. And then they elope to Scotland and get married a year later when she is 16 and he is 19. So obviously everyone is like, wait, you were not supposed to do that. <laughs> not to mention that Percy is a mess. So nowadays we know he could use some serious psychological help. He was continuously bullied throughout his adolescent life and he would go into those violent rages. He was a little paranoid. He kept saying that he was broken into and attacked multiple times. And so definitely not an ideal partner, especially when he wasn't obviously getting any help. And it also wasn't long until Percy started pursuing relations with other women. So two years after the wedding, a daughter is born and literal months later, <laughs> Percy is barely ever at home. So Harriet is left with a newborn child and he is just romancing other women. So at this point, the couple practically separates, but they had to have a hookup at some point because Harriet gets pregnant again. And this is where it gets really messy because at this point, they're, they're separated, she's pregnant, and Percy is involved with Mary Godwin, who later becomes Mary Shelley. So not only was she after a married man, but also his wife was expecting at the time. But also Mary was 16 when they met. And still, undeniably, the villain of this story is Percy Bish Shelley. <laughs> and to prove that, here is a breakup letter that he sent to his estranged pregnant wife Harriet when he got with Mary. October 3rd, 1814. Harriet, you mistake. You obstinately mistake me. I never stated that I had conferred pecuniary benefits on you or that I derived from such sources a claim to your confidence and regard. I had hoped that the more substantial benefits of intellectual improvement and the constant watchfulness of a friendship, ill understood it seems, would not have been degraded by so mean and common a mistake. So he has the audacity, after all that he's done, to be like, you're mean. <laughs> I perceive that your irritated feelings, again, gaslighting her into thinking that she's being the unreasonable one. I perceive that your irritated feelings have led you into this injustice towards me. If my friendship is thus rejected, I cherish little hope of any advantage arising to either of us from our intercourse. So he's like, can we be friends? She's like, obviously not. You cheated on me and you left me with your baby. And he's like, that's an injustice. <laughs> but anyway, back to the letter. I was deeply solicitous that what has taken place should have been avoided, that although united to one perfectly adapted to my nature by a lasting and intense affection, you should have perceived that I continued to be mindful of your happiness, that I would have superintended the progress of your mind and have assisted you in cultivating an elevated philosophy to which without the interest I have taken in your improvement, it is probable that you never would have aspired. Oh my God, he's so toxic. This is scary. So he's like, I would be happy to help you get an education. I think without me, you would not even ever be interested in philosophy and exercising your mind. 
If you inflexibly resist these advances of kindness, if in return for my intentions, you overwhelm me with contumely and reproach, what hope remains of a favorable issue to my ill-requited attempts? I am united to another, you are no longer my wife. Perhaps I have done you injury, but surely most innocently and unintentionally in having commenced any connection with you. I beg your pardon, what is he on about? That injury, whatever be, its amount was not to be avoided. If ever in any degree there was sympathy in our feelings and opinions, wherefore deprive ourselves in future of the satisfaction which may result by this contemptible cavil, these unworthy bickerings. So he's like, why are we arguing? Why are you being so dramatic? We could just be friends and all would be well, but you're being unreasonable with your stupid reproach. Unless a sincere confidence be accorded by you to my undesigning truth, our intercourse for the present must be discontinued. You derive more pain than advantage from the irritations produced by my visits. The interest which I take in you is disturbed by no feelings which prevent me from calmly calculating on your happiness. Collect yourself, I entreat you. Remember what I am. Recall your recollections of my character. The hint respecting my duty to settle the property on you, which your letter contains, proves how little you can appreciate it. You have little need to fear that I shall fail in real duty. Affectionately yours, P.B. Shelley. There is also a, a note after that. I hope that you will attend to the preservation of your health. I do not apprehend the slightest danger from your approaching labor. So she was worried about her labor. He was like, it's not even that big of a deal. <laughs> I think you may safely repose confidence in Sim's skill. That was her physician. Your last labor was painful, but auspicious. I understand that cases of difficulty after that are very rare. So again, obviously a man knows more about labor and how painful it was for her than, than Harriet herself. My dear Harriet, I am anxious for your answer. You must not do me injustice, you have done. So I expect you to repair it. <gasps> the audacity of him trying to get her to apologize. And then there is this. I am in want of stockings, hangs, and Mrs. Wollstonecraft's posthumous works. So she was in possession of some of his stuff and he was like, I want all of it back. I cannot keep the engagement made at three tomorrow. I hear that my personal safety would be endangered by appearing there. Will you inform me where I can call upon the persons? Oh my God, he's such a dick. This is really bad. Anyway, let's jump to 1890s Paris. La Belle Epoque. Paris is blooming with all the cabarets. A certain Liane de Pugy is one of the most famous performers at the time, and she is also a courtesan. And in 1899, she began a love affair with Natalie Clifford Barney. So Natalie saw Liane on stage one day, and she shot her shot by coming over to Liane's place, dressed up as a page, and kneeling down on one knee and professing that she is a page of love sent by Sappho. So, I mean, talk about Riz. And they were together less than a year, but the affair was fiery. It was very influential in terms of their lives. And it was also immortalized by Liane in a part fiction, part biography book, Idyll Sophique. She used some of the tropes from that uh, relationship in the book. I am not sure what exactly happened right before this letter. I know that they both had problems with fidelity. But anyway, this is what Leanne wrote to Natalie the same year they met. I am learning so much about you. Ugh. <laughs> like that's literally what it says. You present yourself as Flossie. By the way, Flossie is the name of the character in the Idyll Safik book that is based on Natalie. You don't even have the courage to use your name and to show yourself without a mask. If you are ashamed of what you are doing, why do you do it? And I, who thought you so beautiful and who believed in you, and you are thinking about coming to me, I am worth more than you, Flossy Natty. I'm prettier, you are ugly, with your yellow skin and reddish eyes. Your head of hair, yes, is ashamed of the rest of you. Your heart doesn't exist. 
you're stuffed with phrases and you're believed and paid attention to. I don't want to think about you anymore for a very long time. Your reputation is sullied everywhere and from all sides. There is nothing real in you. What I used to love doesn't exist and I'm mad at you for having made me discover it. Take care that I never run into you for I would take off your mask in front of everybody. Goodbye. I no longer believe. I no longer hope. I no longer love. Very short, very to the point, very powerful. She was mad. <laughs> so she obviously heard some things about Natalie that made her come to the conclusion that maybe she's not uh, worth being with, at least in her eyes. Now, we all know stories about uh, World War I soldiers falling in love with nurses that are taking care of them. And one of those soldiers was... Da -da 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 -da, Ernest Hemingway and he was 19 at the time. He was like a cute little boy and he fell in love with Agnes von Kurowski who was 26 so a lot older than him and she was engaged to a man back home but nevertheless they linked and she was probably very flattered and for him it was super serious like it was his first girl he was saving up for the wedding and everything. He was really treating it seriously. Well, once he went back to America, her letters began to be a little more casual. She was like, wow, you're so young, ha ha ha. Uh, and I'm so busy with this crazy Italian life. And eventually in 1919, so around a year after they met, she sent him this letter that is honestly the ultimate friend zone letter, <laughs> if you ask me. March 7th, 1919. Ernie, dear boy. So she starts off by basically infantilizing him because he's so much younger. I am writing this late at night after a long thing by myself. And I am afraid it is going to hurt you, but I'm sure it won't harm you permanently. Uh, from what we know, that was not true because he was actually bitter about it for the rest of his life. For quite a while before you left, I was trying to convince myself that it was a real love affair because we always seemed to disagree and then arguments always wore me out so that I finally gave in to keep you from doing something desperate. Now, after a couple of months away from you, I know that I am still very fond of you, but it is more as a mother than a sweetheart. It's all right to say I'm a kid, but I'm not, and I'm getting less and less so every day. So kid is written with a capital letter, so I'm assuming it's like a, it's what they call each other, because then she says, so kid, still kid to me and always will be, can you forgive me someday for unwittingly deceiving you? You know I'm not really bad and don't mean to do wrong. And now I realize it was my fault in the beginning that you cared for me and regret it from the bottom of my heart. But I am now and always will be too old. And that's the truth. And I can't get away from the fact that you're just a boy, a kid. I somehow feel that someday I'll have reason to be proud of you. But dear boy, I can't wait for that day. And it is wrong to hurry a career. I tried hard to make you understand a bit of what I was thinking on that trip from Padua to Milan, but you acted like a spoiled child and I couldn't keep on hurting you. Now I only have the courage because I am far away. Then, and believe me when I say this is sudden for me too, I expect to be married soon. And I hope and pray that after you have thought things out, you'll be able to forgive me and start a wonderful career and show what a man you really are. Ever admiringly and fondly, your friend, <laughs> Aggie. It's clear that the age gap was an issue for her. Like she keeps, she keeps saying that he's way too young and that whenever she was trying to explain it, he got mad and that there are different points in their lives. Clearly she wants him to already have established a career and he is 19, he hasn't done it yet. And she also takes it upon herself that she allowed this to go too far. She says, now I realize it was my fault in the beginning that you cared for me. So she's like, I should have cut it off from the moment you started paying me any attention. And she says that she regrets it. So I think it's, it's actually a very touching letter because it's nothing but the truth. Obviously, from his perspective, he must have felt deceived, but 
she says she's been having doubts for a long time. She says they've been arguing and whenever they were, she would just put it aside because she didn't want to deal with that. She says that she understood that the feelings she has for him are just not enough for a for a relationship. And probably the most hurtful part is just randomly men mentioning that she's getting married because that means that she was involved with another man while she was still with him. So this is probably the only part of the letter that I have issues with. But otherwise, this is very well said and this is very heartbreaking. And I think it's also very telling that she's like, I somehow feel that someday I'll have reason to be proud of you, which is very sweet. Anyway, Edith Wharton. So an iconic writer that is responsible for some of the best portrayals of high society of late 19th, early 20th century. Edith was 45 and her marriage was sort of on its last leg. And then she met Morton Fullerton. Morton was a bisexual man that had a pattern of having short intensive affairs with big names of both sexes and then dropping them straight after. <laughs> but he was also not the one to categorically end things. So he basically left Edith hanging. He was like, let's not give it a name, let's keep it spontaneous, let's keep the good vibes going. And eventually in 1910, she has had enough and she needed closure. And then she sent him this letter. Tuesday, winter 1910. When I received your note of last night, I was really alarmed and sent a line to your hotel at nine o'clock this morning to beg you to rest for a day or two and to ask if there was nothing I could do to help you in any way. But you were not there. What am I to think? When I don't write you for two or three days purposely, you write and telephone to know what is the matter. When I do write and ask if I can help you or see you for a moment, you tell me that you are too ill. And when I send to your hotel at 9 a.m., you are not there. So basically he, he faked being ill to avoid seeing her. You know what I must think. What I have thought during these last mysterious three months, when again and again, seeing how things were, I gave you every chance for an easy transition to amitié. So friendship, basically, in French. She offered for their relationship to transition into friendship instead, and he refused. I don't know why you refused, but since you did, I must ask you now, implore you, not to build up any more of these elaborate échafaudages so structures of pretexts. Okay, here comes an attempt of me reading a French sentence to brace ourselves. Mon pauvre ami, comprends donc que je comprends, que je t'aime, que je suis toujours la tendre amie, que te retrouveras quand tu en auras besoin, <laughs> que tu retrouveras quand tu en auras besoin. And this butchered French sentence means, my poor friend believed that I understand that I love you, that I am always the affectionate friend that you will find when you are in need. But spare me these little hurts. They are so unneeded and every time an incident like this happens, I am sick again with all these accumulated sickness of these last unintelligible months. I hear you say, what, I haven't the right to be absent from my hotel at nine in the morning or any other hour? You have every right, dear over every moment of your time and every feeling, only don't tell me the night before, I am too ill to see you. <laughs> so she is basically, she's giving him receipts that he lied and that she knows that was she to mention it to him, he would gaslight her and go like, oh, so I'm not allowed to leave the hotel now? <laughs> this is horrible. Don't you understand that what hurts me is not the fact of the change, which I find myself able to accept with a kind of cheerful stoicism that reassures me. It is not that, dear, but the pain, the unutterable pain of thinking you capable of understanding my frankness and my honest desire to let you lead your own life. You say, I will be all you have the right to expect. If I have any rights, I renounce them. Don't write to me in that way again. This is powerful. The one thing I can't bear is the thought that I represent to you the woman who has to be lied to. And if I think this, it is your own conduct that has brought it about. Vous l'avez voulu. 
So I guess this is what we wanted. Don't answer, it's useless. I am your camarade. Um, this is how the letter ends. So again, she was mad and I love it for her because it's incredible how these letters are not only meant for the person that was receiving them, but they are also sort of like a journal of a person's feelings and an expression of those feelings. But at the same time, you can tell that they work things through writing those. You can tell that by the end of writing a letter like this, she felt like a huge weight was lifted off her shoulders and she was probably capable of calling her feelings and identifying her feelings much better than she was before writing letters like this. So on this feisty note, I think we're going to end this episode. A lot of pain, a lot of hurt in these letters, and yet one can hope that once they were sent, the authors got some sort of closure and were able to move on. But it also makes you realize that love and relationships in the past were just as messy as they are nowadays. And perhaps now we label it ghosting or love bombing or being avoidant or gaslighting. And back then, not only people had to deal with this sort of behavior, not knowing which way to behave is actually correct, but they also had no psychological essays to watch on YouTube <laughs> on the topic to understand what's being done to them. So you know what is morally correct and you had to base your compass, your moral compass off of that, but it also varied from person to person. I guess it was it was just easy to be manipulated into thinking that being treated wrong is normal because you had no comparison. Like, I guess you discussed it with your friends, but but apart from that, especially as a woman, you were probably thinking this is what it's supposed to be like. So that's why I think those letters are an incredible display of strength because those women came to those conclusions on their own. Like, they did not listen to relationship podcasts. They did not read PDF documents about attachment style. This is just something that they felt, this is not right. This is not correct. I will not be treated like this. And that's why I think those letters are incredible. So anyway, wishing you a happy Valentine's Day and lots of beautiful love letters in your lifetime. Hopefully no breakup letters. And until next time. Bye.